Hey everybody, so today I am here to do the Q&A that I had listed on my Instagram. So I asked you guys for questions over there and you sure did deliver. The reason this Q&A took so long is I have tried to film it time and time again, but this is probably gonna be a long one. So I would just grab a snack and a drink right now. I do think this is the last time I'm going to be able to answer everybody's questions because there are just so many and you guys are great. So I think from here on out, if I do a Q&A, I'll just have to pick the most interesting interesting questions or questions that get asked frequently stuff like that I thought I heard a baby crying it's like late at night and I'm just hoping the girls stay asleep through me filming sometimes if they hear my voice when they're supposed to be sleeping they get upset and they start crying so we're just gonna have to see okay so first question would you still have chosen to EP with Remy if she hadn't had feeding issues or would you have preferred direct nursing no my plan was to exclusively pump the entire pregnancy even through her feeding issues and quite honestly both my girls have had reflux and GERD and a ton of feeding problems and in my opinion I'm glad that I've exclusively pumped through all that it made it a ton easier number two how did I meet my husband and how did we come up with the girls names Mark and I worked at a pizza shop together and he was a pizza delivery boy and I worked in the kitchen I was also a waitress there and there was a lot of mornings we had to work together and like make the dough and stuff and we just became friends and that's kind of how it all started and then as far as how we picked the girls names my husband is probably the hardest person to pick baby names with I mean obviously I haven't picked them with anybody else but still I'd venture to say he's pretty bad because he does not like anything I could have a list with 20 names long and he will like maybe one out of all of them so Sophie and Remy's names have just been names that we've actually agreed upon. Number three, do I still think about vlogging? If so, when will I? Yes, I'm still thinking about it. I'm not entirely sure how I feel about everything. I'm still trying to wrap my head around some stuff. If you watch my last chit chat video, you know what I'm talking about. And as far as when I will, I'm not really sure. I thought the sound was like permanently messed up on my phone, but I think a software update might have fixed it. But I feel like if I am going to start vlogging, it'd be sometime in the near future. Number four, do I have any experience or have any knowledge about painful MER that stands for milk ejection reflux or a letdown? And how do I keep up with my pumping schedule? As far as experience and knowledge with the MER, I don't have a ton of experience in the beginning of every breastfeeding journey. It is a little painful during my letdowns, but it does gradually go away. But as far as knowledge about it, it is pretty common to have a painful MER during the first few weeks of postpartum. But if it continues, I would probably go see an LC. It may be just fine, but I just go to make sure. And as far as how to keep up on my, or how I keep up on my pumping schedule, I just look at it as non-negotiable. I've said this before, I just look at it as something that needs to be done the same way I do with dishes or laundry or whatever. It's not a question, it needs to get done. I don't care who has a problem with it, what I have to do, I need to pump and everything has to work around that. It's how I nourish my child, it's how I feed my child, so I just have to put it first sometimes. Number five, how did I go about weaning from the pump? That is a video that's gonna be coming because I am actually officially weaned. Number six, what advice do I have for first time moms who want to breastfeed but it's painful? Not just from a latch, but it hurts and bleeds. And also, what is my favorite diaper bag that isn't jujube or expensive? The first part of your question, I would definitely go see an LC because even though you're saying that it's not from a latch, it should never bleed and you really shouldn't have any kind of pain with breastfeeding. It is going to be a little sore and uncomfortable at first with your breast getting used to it, but bleeding is a sure sign that something is not working right. So I would definitely get an LC to check you out. Also with that, I would use Apno for your cracked and bleeding nipple to help heal that up and just try to take it easy and uh, nurse from the other side as frequently as possible if you can. And as far as my favorite diaper bag that isn't jujube or expensive, that would be Skip Hop. They make really great diaper bags. You can find them at Bye Bye Baby and Babies Are Us. I was trying to think of where I've gotten them from. And you can always find like a 20% off coupon, 25% off coupon, or if it's your registry, sometimes they send you that 15% off coupon, stuff like that. They make really great diaper bags. But that leads me into something that I want to talk to you guys about. I know for the most part, my channel is budget friendly, but diaper bags is something that I've strayed away from 
over the years because it's been an area that I like kind of treat myself to. Now as a mom, I like to invest in more expensive diaper bags. That's just what I like to do. That's how I treat myself. But I wanted to ask you guys what diaper bags you would like to see me review that are budget friendly. Let me know like the price range and everything down below because that is something I want to get back into because I started this channel using that $50 diaper bag and now I use ones that are well over that. So I would like to get back into that. Number seven, what are products do you regret buying or getting for pumping? And I don't really have any. The one that I can maybe think of is the Medela Sonata, but I don't necessarily regret that because I was still able to review it and make a how-to video, which is obviously helpful. So I can't say that I regret it entirely, but it's the only only product that I've gotten and I don't use and as far as me reviewing things and maybe not seeing them all the time I am not able to use every single product that I'm ever sent I'm very fortunate and I'm very glad that I'm able to work with the companies that I do very fortunate I will always be thankful for that however I could not possibly in a single day use everything and I don't always need to so Number eight is how to transition from nursing to EP because of a teething baby. I just want to mention before I answer your question that if you're kind of anticipating your baby being a monster with teething and stuff like that, I want to assure you that there are women who nurse through that and it's something that you can get past with no problem. You know, there's women who obviously nurse all the way into toddlerhood. So if that is something that you would like to do, you just don't know of women who have done that. I just wanted to throw that out there. But if you're, you know, that's what you want to do. You want to EP before the baby gets teeth. I understand that as well. I have a video that I will have linked for you when it comes to transitioning from nursing to pumping. But basically what it is, what it entails is replacing nursing sessions with pumping sessions and slowly transitioning baby to. Number nine is how much more milk, how much more milk, how much more difficult is two children versus one? What makeup products do I use and what snacks do Remy and Sophie eat on the go? As far as how difficult one versus two is, I would say, I don't know, it's it's pretty difficult compared to one. With one, you only have one child to worry about. You know, you only have one set of things to worry about. But when you get to two kids, one might be potty trained, one might be in diapers, one might require medicine, the other one doesn't. You know, you get into all this kind of stuff and you're dealing with two different people's needs and wants and stuff like that. So it does start to get a little complicated. And then you also have stuff like getting into car seats, which one do you put in first and, you know, stuff like that. So it is more difficult, obviously, than one child. But I wouldn't say it's crazy or anything undoable, obviously. As far as what makeup products I use, I'm pretty 50-50 when it comes to high-end versus drugstore. My foundation and my mascara are from the drugstore. I'm trying to look in the viewfinder to see what I have on. My eyeshadow that I use for my eyebrows and my eyeshadow, which is more oftentimes than not my eyeliner, but my actual eyeliner itself. Those are all high-end Makeup Forever and MAC and Lorac. And then... I think that's all I use anymore. I used to use a lot more. All my blushes from MAC too. Um, that's really all I use as far as makeup goes. And those are just items that I've done like tried and true. Um, like I just don't stray from them anymore. I've used them for years and they work for me. And then as far as snacks for Remy and Sophie on the go, I just carry things that I don't typically have at home. Like we have Annie Ann's granola bars and whole grain peanut butter crackers. In my diaper bag right now I believe and those are just things that we don't keep in the cupboard at home so they're really excited to eat those if we're out okay I talked far too long about this the first time I answered it so number 10 is what my hair care routine is basically I only wash my hair once maybe twice a week if I can't help it I wash it with Wella shampoo but we're slowly going to be switching over to a matrix brand because I want something that's paraben and sulfate free and after I get out of the shower, I go ahead and I put a Matrix hair product on it. I brush it with my professional wet brush paddle brush and I just let it air dry overnight because I take my showers at night. And then in between washes, I just use a dry shampoo that I've found at Walmart that's cheap. It works well. It's also paraben and sulfate free. So I'm in love with it. And I think that's about everything. Oh, I do spray hairspray on my hair if I want some texture. It's a Sebastian one. I believe it's the Shaper. Also at this time of year, every time I wash my hair or before I should say, I do a coconut oil treatment because I have extremely dry skin ever since having kids. I used to be super oily, now I'm super dry. So especially this time of year where it's just really dry and cold outside, 
I deal with it like a lot. So I do have to put some coconut oil up around my hairline and kind of like all the way back here. And I will let that sit on my scalp, just soak in. And then I take a toothbrush and very gently kind of massage my scalp and get off any kind of dry flaky skin that I have up there and that's what I do before I wash my hair but that's all I do as far as my hair goes never really use any heat on it because it just drives me nuts and my friend from cosmetology school cuts my hair when I actually make an appointment and go to it <laughs> number 11 is one of my favorite meals for the girls as far as breakfast goes it's whatever is quickest whether that is cereal or waffles or what's the other thing oatmeal anything like that they always typically have a banana with that as well and as far as lunch goes i find it better if they eat more of like snack foods almost so we might do like a yogurt bowl or we'll do some i don't i don't even know how to put it i just make a whole bunch of little stuff opposed to like an actual meal for them and they eat that far better normally it's a ton of fruits and veggies and like a spoonful of peanut butter they go crazy over that and as far as dinner it's been a nightmare lately because neither one of them want to eat anymore i don't know what it is they'd rather eat macaroni and cheese seven nights a week than eat my homemade meals number 12 is how do you increase your supply after it's regulated i'm going to link a video on how to increase your milk supply because i've already made that Number 13, how do I decide what breast milk gets fed versus what gets frozen? Personally, I was always two bottles ahead of Rummy and Sophie, so I would just either keep those out or I would put them in the fridge, whatever it kind of called for at the time, and anything that I pumped more would be extra and that would get frozen. Anything that my girls didn't eat, I would freeze basically. Number 13, oh that was number 13. Number 14, what routine would I recommend to a nursing mom who needs a frozen stash? I would not start pumping right away. I would only pump about two, four weeks before you need a stash. Just start with one pump session a day, maybe work your way up to two and slowly build up that stash. And then when you're away from baby, make sure that you're pumping as often as baby would nurse. I told you guys it was gonna be a long one. Number 15, how did I prepare Sophie for the arrival of her little sister? How many children do we want? And will I EP for our third? As far as preparing Sophie, really, we really didn't. She was too young to really understand. Obviously we talked about Remy. She knew there was a baby, but she doesn't grasp it and that's kind of to your advantage at that age because they don't really know or notice for the most part but as far as um how many kids we want i would say at least four biological children and the reason why i say that is my body has to be done at four c-sections i personally think that would be our limit just about children in general having four kids at home however who knows we've already talked about it down the line if we ever wanted more than four kids we would obviously adopt because my body needs to be done and as far as will i ep for our third yes that is my plan number 16 after going back to school and pursuing your dream what advice could you give to other mamas who are struggling with balancing mom life and also prioritizing themselves my advice would be to do it and find time for it whether it's walking out to your mailbox and getting the mail by yourself or taking 15 minutes in the bathroom without having anybody bothering you a late night bath watching a tv show after everybody's gone to sleep going grocery shopping by yourself hanging out at a friend's house at you know whatever it might be you need to do it you need to be whoever you are as an individual to be a better mom to be a better wife to be a better whatever i really do truly believe that i've now spent over three years being a stay-at-home mom and that is becoming more and more obvious to me it's easy when you're responsible for so many other people in your household to forget about yourself to put yourself on the back burner and i totally understand that i'm not saying that i never do that anymore i think as women it just comes second nature and that's just something that we're constantly doing however it's really important to push yourself forward and to be on that front burner every once in a while or as often as you can allow it within reason obviously i think just in general i would encourage you to have the confidence to say that you need alone time to say that you might need this or you want that and the confidence to reach out and see who could be around you to help you whether it's you know your mom or an in-law or your significant other like whatever it is have people around you to help achieve that you know because it really 
really is important to figure out your wants and needs as an individual to help you be better things in your life. Okay, I gotta go a little bit quicker because my camera is getting overheated. But as far as the last question I was on, oh yeah, would I ever make a day in the life? I've made exclusively pumping days in the life, but I haven't made any others because I'm not sure you guys are ready for like what true life is. I'm definitely not one of those people who has like a picture perfect day and we have a nice little schedule that we always stick to. It's madness, it's crazy, it's messy around here, so... I don't know, I'm kind of hesitant because I can't, I don't feel bad with like letting things like that hang out, but at the same time, I don't wanna put them out there if nobody's gonna appreciate it, so I don't know. Number 18, some budget saving tips for a one income household. I'm gonna rattle these off because I just wrote them down underneath your question. Cut your grocery bill, shop at discount stores, shred your own cheese, buy snacks that'll go a long way, try to space out how much meat you use, get a streaming service versus a traditional cable or satellite service, live within your budget, lots of free things for kids to do, focus on necessities not once, go without now to do more later, and work on your debt and lowering your debt when you can. That was basically some highlights. If you guys would like a more in-depth video on, you know, how we make things work with me being a stay-at-home mom, I can do that for you. Uh, number 19, can you relactate re after you've stopped pumping for a month? How long will it take to get a good supply? Yes, you can. The typical kind of saying as far as relactating goes, it takes as long as you've been weaned to see a milk supply come back. So basically, since you've been weaned a month, it's probably going to take a month of pumping before you see any milk. And after that, it just really depends. You know, some people get their supply back. Other people don't, and you might have to supplement, stuff like that. But it definitely is possible to relactate. Number 20, I had lots of questions on what my favorite pump was and like what I recommended. Lansano, Signature Pro, or Smart Pump is what I recommend the most. Those are the same uh, motor. They just come with different accessories. The Signature Pro is cheaper, but it's also being phased out to be replaced by the smart pump. So just get whatever your budget allows, basically. And number 21, I've had a lot of questions as far as my courses with my lactation education. And I'm going to be doing a more in-depth video on that as well, but I wanna wait until I'm finished so I can give you guys like my tips and advice and all that kind of good stuff. Number 22 is one breastfeeding accessory I couldn't live without. And this one's really hard, really, really hard. And I had to think about it for a long time, and that's why I made the top five breastfeeding accessories, because I just feel like those five, I really wouldn't want to live without. Like, I would replace those the second they broke. But if I had to pick one, yeah. It's going to be the Little Buds Breast Comfort Packs, because those are just so nice. Like, I don't know how to explain it. I guess maybe because they were helpful in so many different ways, whether it was my vasospasm, my mastitis, my thrush, clogs, engorgement, like just everything, you know, like those were just so nice to heat up, put on my boobs. They were, they, they were just a lifesaver, a ton. And the second part to that question, most memorable moment in my pumping journey, I think that would just have to be the fact that I kept going regardless. Um, what I mean is that I had a lot of stuff happen in the past year and nine months that I had been pumping. It was stuff like mastitis and thrush, vasospasms and oversupply, Remy's feeding issues. Like we just had a lot of stuff going on and even just like with myself personally, just from the start. And I think the start was Remy's feeding issues. You know, we were in and out of the children's hospital. That was an hour trip. She had appointments with different specialists all day long while we were there. Obviously, I also had to drop Sophie off at her grandparents to be watched there and just different stuff like that. So like in between all of that hectic and craziness and also dealing with Remy when we were home, which was not easy because of all her feeding issues, it was like, I can't believe that I took the time to stay on schedule and to stick with it. But at the end of the day, I knew that's what was going to help her the most. So I think that's what got me through it because I remember being in that children's hospital and literally just sitting there crying in their pumping room while Remy was finally asleep. And it was just because it was just so surreal to me that I was doing this and that 
I, I don't know that we were there. If you don't know, Remy struggled really badly with a feeding aversion, and GERD, failure to thrive, just like a whole bunch of different stuff when she was really, really young. She just spent what I felt like was months of her life crying and in pain and not wanting to eat. And it meant a lot of work on Mark and I's part and part of that work for me was pumping. So I felt like pumping was a way to help her. And then after that, you know, she slowly got better and she was doing better. But then it just became like managing my oversupply because it had kicked into overdrive, which I'm not trying to complain at all. I'm super grateful for it. But it did take a lot of time to learn and understand. I was in a lot of pain for a long time. And then once I got through that, I think that's when my mastitis struck. And that's just miserable. Anybody knows that. And just throughout all these different things, you know, I always, I wanted to stop. I wanted to quit. I wanted to give my attention to something better. But I told myself, just make it through it. And at the end of the day, I made it through a lot of stuff. And I'm really just proud of that. Thank you, Water Pump for ruining the moment. And the last question or questions I guess I should say is what breast milk storage bags do I use and how much do I make now that I'm weaning? As far as my breast milk storage bags, I have always pretty much used Lancenow just because they are the cheapest that I can get and the bulk that I need. Like I said, I was an oversupplier so I was having to get bags constantly and they're just the cheapest. They're also just the most convenient so that's what I stuck with. And I've never had any problems with them ever since their redesign. And as far as how much do I make now that I'm weaning, uh, it's just been like a slow gradual thing. I would say I didn't see a severe drop until I got down to one pump per day. And then I was producing maybe 16 ounces a day, maybe if that. And keep in mind, I was an exclusive pumper past a year when I say 16 ounces a day. And, um, and then it's just slowly from there, it's just been a decrease of that. But in my very last days of weaning, I was just producing drops. And that was just hand expression. But that is all of your guys' questions. Like I said, it was going to be a long one. This is going to be the last time I can answer all your guys' questions. But you guys are just so great at giving them to me. So, not complaining. But I do hope that you guys enjoyed the video. And as always, thanks for watching.